Singa ba hamba yoti na gulom shaba. Siye kaya hezulwini. Singa ba hamba yoti na gulom shaba. Siye kaya hezulwini. Siti haleluya. Haleluya. Haleluya, haleluya, haleluya. Siti haleluya. Haleluya. Haleluya, haleluya, haleluya. Very good morning. Reporting from East London in the Eastern Cape. This is Penny Wild the Black Pen. As promised yesterday on Twitter, I'm making a video about interest rates credit for black people. Uh, I think this is going to be an important video and I realized that I think I will need to make a similar video like this on a regular basis. Um, repetition is the father of learning. I repeat, repetition is the father of learning. If I want you to learn something, I need to repeat it constantly. Making one video in 2017, for example, is not good enough. I need to constantly keep making new videos or at least constantly bringing back the video from 2017. Yesterday or the day before on Twitter, a lady posted um, a tweet speaking about how black people are charged a higher interest rate by the banks. Some of the banks charging double interest rates on, on black people. As someone who's worked in banking and more especially in the specific spaces that grant credit and give out interest rates to black people, I felt a need to comment um, I think I got good likes for my post, over 200 likes for people that I guess supported what I had to say, but it, it led to a, a larger conversation. Um, I was attacked along with some other people who agreed with me, and I figured, you know what, I think there's a lot of uh, missing information, and I wanted to address this in a video with the hope that at least the video will clarify my, standing, my standpoint. For a bit of context, our country comes from a history of colonization and apartheid, where black people were actively kept out of our economy. From 1990-1994, when apartheid ended and we entered into democracy and the ANC won the elections with Nelson Mandela as the president, we now live in a country where black people are slowly but surely beginning to become economically active. In becoming economically active, unfortunately, black people have not been educated on how the economy works, how money works, how credit, how inflation and all these other things work, and people are generally really still struggling with understanding what we call financial literacy. Financial literacy is not taught at schools. Sadly, and I can speak from experience as someone who went to university to study accounting and economics and taxation and auditing, um, management, management accounting, finance, and all these other really, really fancy financial subjects. I can tell you now that universities don't teach fin financial literacy as well. Got friends who are chartered accountants, I've got friends who are bankers, got friends who are actuaries, um, who are struggling with their own personal finances, living beyond their means, have a lot of debt. So sadly, a lot of people still don't understand the money game. I've been a money coach for a couple of years, teaching a lot of people via WhatsApp, via online videos, etc. How money works and the fact that money is a game, just like soccer, just like rugby, just like chess. It's a game and if you can learn the rules, you can learn the game. And once you learn the game, you can start getting good at the game. Yes, there are talented people, just like in soccer. We, I can play soccer for 50 years and I won't be Cristiano Ronaldo or Lionel Messi because they have a special talent. I can play soccer for 30 years. Doesn't necessarily mean I will be a good coach or does not mean that I will become a good owner of a club. Some people have unique skills even after they know the rules of a game, to excel in those games. And that's fundamentally important. But the game has rules. And most people don't understand the rules of the money game. Banks are seen as the lifeblood and the heartbeat of economies. In South Africa, we've got a couple of big banks, APSA being one of them. Standard Bank, APSA is the biggest bank in the country. Standard Bank, Standard Bank is the biggest bank on the African continent. Um, we've got um, NetBank. And we have got First National Bank. First National Bank has been a very innovative bank over the years. Um, 
Over maybe 10 years ago now, we've had a, a new entry, which has come in blazing, known as Capitec. Um, recently, we've seen uh, Time Bank, Yapuchis Mutsipe, be awarded a license, a digital bank. Uh, Discovery has got a bank as well, the Discovery Bank. And I believe Michael Jordan, who used to be the ex-CEO of FNB, um, is kicking off Zero Bank, which I think will have zero bank charges as well. Um, those are our retail banks which are popularly known. They retail because you guys normally bank with them, transact ATMs. We have business banks, uh, Mercantile Bank, which I think has been absorbed by Capitec, a couple of other business banks you may not may not know. But popular ones uh, that offer business credit, uh, being Investec, being Rand Merchant Bank, RMB. Um, they also deal with private clients as well. Um, there's a whole lot of other banks. If you go on Wikipedia and you look at a, uh, the, the list of the banks in South Africa, some of them are local, some of them are foreign. We've got Bank of Athens, for example. We've got some Islamic banks that have a base here. Um, I believe um, the Chinese Construction Bank has a building as well in Santon. There's a lot of banks, but like I said, the retail banks are the most popular and they're the ones that we need to understand. The banks that we have are governed by the Banks Act, which is set by the South African Reserve Bank which is basically the big regulator of all the banks in the country. South African Reserve Bank is known as an independent entity. Obviously, this is extremely arguable. It has got private shareholders. I believe Tito Mboweni, Pravin Kordan. I know there's a, a, a chunk of Europeans that own shares. I don't think they're allowed to have dividends. I don't even know why we have private shareholders, but they claim to be independent, but they set the rules for banking. South African Reserve Bank is um, a subset of the Central Bank of London, which sets the blueprint and the template for banks across the entire world. South African Reserve Bank controls money supply. And to do that, they tweak interest rates. We, we are now using what's called fiat currency in the world. Fiat currency means the governments set the value of the currency based on interest rates, based on money supply, based on global markets. Before that, we used to be on the gold standard. So the country that owns the most gold has the strongest currency. We have fiat currency now. We're beginning to slowly, very slowly move into having an alternative being crypto currencies, which are underpinned by blockchain technology. In tweaking the interest rates, what then happens is we create what's called a repo rate, which impacts the prime rate. The prime rate is the minimum rate that the banks can loan at. So the banks will give you prime plus whatever the case may be um, to give you credit. We have the Na National Credit Act, the NCA, which governs interest rates and has maximums. Last I checked, the maximum interest you can be charged in this country is 32% per annum. On personal loans, I think with home loans, it's a lower amount. Generally, if your average risk in this country, your home loan shouldn't be more than 10% interest per annum. If you're looking at short-term loans, one month, two months, up to six months, the maximum that can be charged is 5% per month. 5% over 12 months becomes 60%. But the hope is that you will be taking out this money for one month, uh, three months, for example. This impacts credit cards. It impacts clothing accounts, furniture accounts, and these other credit items that you guys get, including things like cell phones. What the banks have done, because there's something called an initiation fee, an initiation fee is like a transaction administration fee. That one is kept, uh, last I checked, I think at 1,000 Rand plus VAT. So it would be 1,150. So even though you may be charged 5% on a 1,000 Rand loan, 5% on a 1,000 Rand loan on a short-term loan is 50 Rand. So then you ask, but why am I paying 300 Rand instead of 50 Rand? The other 250 Rand is what's called the initiation fee. And they can charge it every time you take out a new loan. This is how the game works, just explaining it to you. I worked at APSA in personal loans uh, for two and a half years, I believe. I worked as a credit analyst. And what I did is I basically tracked how our personal loans were performing in the country. Part of my work included managing the scorecard. A scorecard is what I used to explain to normal people on the streets as the engine that determines who gets a loan and at what interest rate. To run this engine, we have um, fields, fields uh, that inform the scorecard. And these fields we largely get from the credit bureau. The credit bureaus, we have two major ones in South Africa. The first one being TransUnion. 
the second one being Experian. They capture all the credit data that's happening. So when you apply for a loan from a bank, when you get a credit card, when you open a store account, etc., etc., they upload all of that data onto their databases. And whenever you are applying for, for a loan, for example, from a bank, they go and they pull that data. They pay a subscription to pull that data to look at your past behavior. How has this person been dealing with credit? Very importantly. Um, so we had certain fields that we pulled from there. And then we had our own certain fields that we pulled from inside. So when you're applying for a loan, obviously you'll put in your name, maybe your ID number, uh, maybe your gender, those type of things. And then we would have our own internal information and fields. And then we'd get the external ones from Experian and from TransUnion, which are meant to be updated regularly because people's credit profiles change. Your credit profile has a score. And at some point, I guess I will speak about the scores that you can get. What is a good score? What is a bad score? In this country, people speak about being blacklisted. Being blacklisted is not a real technical legal term. It only generally means that you have a low credit score. And if you have a low credit score, it means the chances are you're not going to be approved for credit products. But there's no such thing as blacklisting where you can't get credit. You, you will always have a credit score. Once you become credit active, can become credit active by opening a clothing account, getting a cell phone and contract, um, et cetera, et cetera. After working at APSA, I then went to go and work at Standard Bank for a year as a credit manager under vehicle and asset finance. Um, I ran some of the coding that was running a lot of the data. I looked after our call centers. I looked after our auction houses for cars. Um, and I spoke to the guys that basically were doing all of the data for credit. Um, so I'm saying this because I'm, I'm not speaking just as someone who's read. Reading this information is good enough. But I'm also speaking as someone who was on the inside. Our credit scorecards in this country and people in banking will tell you. I cannot speak much for insurance because insurance is slightly different. They also use their own scorecards as well. Our credit scorecards in this country do not base an application whether it gets approved or rejected on your race. Neither does it do it based on your gender. That's very, very important to understand. We may have those fields, and we did have those fields. Why? For statistical purposes. So that when we're capturing the stuff, if we ever have to feed into stats essay, so that we just have a view. This is how it works. But constitutionally, we're not allowed to discriminate in any way based on race or gender in the banks. I worked with the scorecards. I saw them. I can look at your application, or I could look at your application and see exactly what you triggered. And race was not a trigger. And gender was not a trigger. So I have to say fundamentally, it's very important for people to understand that just because you are black doesn't mean that the bank will reject your loan. Just because you're black doesn't mean that your interest rates will become higher. That's a misconception. But here's what you need to understand now. And this is why I started off by saying our history includes colonization and apartheid. And the fact that we've only now becoming economically active. So because we are now only becoming economically active, that means there's a lot of things we've missed in understanding how am I supposed to move? How do I improve my credit score? What should I apply for? There's a lot of lack of information in terms of these things. The reason black people are discriminated against by the banks and maybe the insurance companies is because of, I guess, what you guys call systematic or systemic racism. That means it's not explicit, but it is indirect. <laughs> So because you're not economically literate, you go and you apply for loans from 15 different places. And you don't know that at the credit bureau, that lowers your score. It gives you a bad score when you're constantly applying for credit. When you are getting your loans from these payday loan shops, these loan shops, I don't want to mention the names, man. Um, it's unnecessary. But when you get your loans from those places, they get flagged. If you have a lot of credit cards, you get flagged. That stuff lowers your credit score because according to past data, if you're constantly applying for credit, if you have a lot of credit cards, if you have a lot of clothing accounts, etc., cetera, um, chances are you're not going to pay well. And that's not a race thing. That's a financial behavior thing. But as we know, Abantaba Miyama don't have money. So they obviously keep loaning money from these places, especially because we've constantly got funerals. We've constantly got weddings. We've got black tax. Money we need to send home. 
Some of us take out uh, phone contracts for our parents or our siblings. Some of us open clothing accounts because the kids at home need to buy school fees and whatever the case may be. All of those accounts are picked up at the credit bureau. And the more people are taking out these accounts, the more we worry. Why do you have so many credit accounts? And it, it speaks badly for you. And if any of them are not paid on time, if any of you default one month, two months, that picks up. So your clothing account, ah, shit, I forgot to pay my clothing account. It picks up at the bureau. Your mom forgot to pay the phone contract that you opened for her. You just got another credit card because your card just got smashed. That stuff is tracking. The algorithms are being built. And our scorecard is picking up all that behavior. And Abantabam Nyam, unfortunately, have got bad financial behavior because you have not been taught financial literacy. Even if you're earning the average 3.6 per month, or even if you're earning 40,000 per month as a black person living in Santon. But for the fact that you have black tax and you have all these accounts, and worse, you're swiping constantly because you're trying to floss, trying to live large, soft life. We're picking up that stuff. So what happens is you end up either getting rejected for a loan or you get approved for a loan, but you look like high risk. And we assign a higher interest rate for higher risk. You guys need to remember that a bank is a business. It's cool. Banks are meant to be... <laughs> bank is not an NGO, man. Bank is not a non-profit. They're not here to come and really make your life easier. How can we help you? <laughs> no, it's how can we help you help us make money for shareholders, for employees. So that's fundamentally, fundamentally important. From an insurance perspective, I know they use other fields like, let's say you have car insurance. They want to know where you're based. Clale Alex, where there's high crime. Clale Deep Sluit. You're obviously going to be assigned higher premiums based on past behavior in the neighborhood. So when you're like, yeah, but I work with this white guy in the company and why is his, interest, why is his insurance premiums lower? It's because of the neighborhood he lives in. Go move there. And you'll see it, literally. Literally. Once you become financially literate, what also happens, and because I worked in banking, I saw this, and I've explained to people that Indians are very good at sharing knowledge. Uh, white people are good at sharing knowledge with each other. Black people are not. We're just happy to have the knowledge by ourselves. A lot of us who worked in banking wouldn't even go home to go and explain to our mothers and our grandmothers and our grandfathers and our aunts and our uncles how the bank works. We used to get a lot of applications escalated. And escalation means you go to the bank, your loan gets rejected. Ah, there you go. So yeah, bye. The people that understand how the money game works and how banking works know that you can escalate and say, no, I know I was rejected, but please can you send this to our head office and ask them to review it. And we would review it and a lot of the applications we would end up approving. A lot of, especially white people, would come in complaining about the interest we charged. Why am I paying 17%? I think I'm good risk. Please review and we'd review and you'd see interest going from 17% to 10%. Along with an email apologizing, we apologize for the interest we'd given you. We've given you a concession of 7%. Thank you so much for using our bank. Banks are meant to serve you because you're making them money. But you guys don't know that. You see them as these big monster corporations. And you're so emotionally attached to money, of course. It was designed like that. It's the same way you're emotionally attached to politicians. You guys don't know that teachers are public servants. The police, traffic cops are public servants. Traffic cops shouldn't be stopping you on the side of the road and harassing you. Your tax pays their salaries. They are on the streets to help you, not to bully you. So if they come to you and they're bullying you and they're shouting at you, you need to get their details and you need to report them. Along with their lack of economic financial literacy, we have a huge vacuum in political literacy. And the politicians need you to not know because that's what gives them power. Your ignorance. Your ignorance gives them power. And once you become empowered and you know your rights and your responsibilities and you know what um, actions you can take, these guys will stop bullying you. We've seen Afri Forum constantly take our government to court. Constantly. Because they understand their rights. They understand the principles. We, we don't understand the law and what they're meant to do for us. And the banks break laws. <laughs> the banks are no different to any other company out there, man. They not. You guys get abused by Oma Shonisa in Makasi. Um, you guys get abused by certain stores that overcharge for things. Um, you guys get sold rotten foods. Banks are no different and banks are run by human beings. So if I'm a rogue, corrupt person 
I will obviously fiddle with stuff. And from the legacy of apartheid, there's a lot of banks that have contravened the constitution and have used in the past race to charge black people higher rates, especially in townships, when you're buying your four room. And they've been caught out. Those banks have been caught out and they've been taken to court. And if you feel that's happened, go and review. They've violated the constitution and your human rights. But I'm telling you, someone that worked in the bank, that the scorecards don't have that. When did it change? I don't know. I started working for banks in 20, 2010. So I can't speak for before that and the corruption and those things that happened before that. And I can't speak for rogue, corrupt people that are in banks even today. In the same way, we can speak about the law, but they are corrupt politicians. And I can tell you if I was a politician that, look, we have a law and we have to follow these acts and, and could be like, yeah, but that guy was corrupt. And I'm like, I can't speak for him. I'm telling you about the law that I know. Having gone out working in the bank, one of the things that I pushed for us to do was to go and visit the branches, to go and sit with the tellers and ask the consultants and ask, what struggles do you guys have? What do you see happening? Because us at head office, literally we're in an ivory tower. We look at the numbers and we blah, 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 but we don't have a real feel of what's happening on the ground. And I wanted us to go there. And the consultants, luckily, because we came as a team, they said the things that we wanted to hear, but... I have a skill of getting through to people. I got some of those men and women to actually open up to me. And I'd go to visit these branches on my own without the team. And I'd ask, so how do you guys work? And what happens? And what pressure are you under? And I told them I work at head office. And I want us to make your lives easier. And they'd confide in me and they'd, and they'd tell me what they did. A lot of your consultants are, are putting in fake numbers in your applications. Number one, because they have targets to meet in terms of the number of loans they need to get. And they have targets in terms of interest rates to charge. That's how they earn their bonuses. So you'll tell them or they'll look at your pay slip. You're earning 12000 And then after that, they don't ask you anything else. They're meant to ask you, do you have any other expenses? But they don't. Because they know if you give them all your list of expenses, chances are you'll be rejected. So they fiddle. Sometimes the application will get declined. And then they'll be like, no, just give me a, a, a minute. And then they'll fig fiddle around with new numbers then all of a sudden gets approved, but it gets approved probably at a higher rate because they are trying to chase targets set by us at head office who are blind to what's happening on the ground. They lie to people about what they should input. One of the input fields, which is also not meant to discriminate, we don't use it to calculate, is what is this money for? So if you say the money is for Ilobolo, if the money is for a business loan, because you, it's a personal loan using your salary, I want to do it for my business, I want to build extra rooms, no, my mom needs surgery. We'd collect that just so that we have some kind of idea. But a lot of times people lie. And if they're not lying, the consultants just put in anything there. General, home improvements, whatever. The date is not accurate. So a lot of the consultants are fiddling around with these things. And even when you get approved, you get approved at a higher interest rate because you're not financially literate. And a lot of them just want to get paid. It's very sad. A lot of people can't pay back their loans, of course, uh, because... Generally, the economy has been bad for a while and it's extremely bad for black people. Black people don't have money. The average black salary is 3.6. The average white salary comparatively is 11 to 12,000 rand a month. So black people don't earn well. Black people don't have jobs. You know, we've got 40% black graduate unemployment, 72% unemployment, youth unemployment, sorry, and over 40% general unemployment. People don't have jobs. So the little bit of money that you have when you're taking out loans and stuff, you'll struggle to pay it back. And that just keeps bringing up these red flags at the credit bureau. And that's why your scorecard, when, when we look, review your scorecard, we see that you're bad risk. So if we can't be charging you, let's say the maximum of 32% per year, per year, you then obviously go to Umashonis because you're bad credit, because you don't have money and you don't understand money. Umashonis are because of his own, and it might be mental, uh, it might be a, a mind thing, it might be because Mashonisa has a booklet. They know how people have fucked them over in the past, not paying back. I used to be Mashonisa and I've lost over 600,000 Rand from people that I trusted genuinely. People who called me crying. My child is sick, they're in hospital, pain, and you send 5,000 Rand. I've never seen that money. And someone else who was a close friend, you give them 10,000 for their business. They fuck you over. You never see that money. The guy's living large now. So Omashon is a price for their risk and they price 40% a month, 50% a month 
because of your payment behavior. So they abuse you, apparently, based on their market. Black people and the white banks you feel are abusing you as well. And a big part of it is just your behavior. If all of you, if all of the people that took our credit paid most of the time, all the time, I think Omar Shonisa wouldn't need to charge such high interest. I believe the banks would lower their interest. They'd be like, you know, the payment rate is so great. People pay back. Going back to the banks, we used to have a threshold for projects because I used to constantly try and push the envelope. I wanted as many black people at the time to get as much credit as possible. So when I was at EPSA, we, we introduced what was called the express loan, which was the one month to six month loan. I was shocked that that had not existed before I got there. Uh, I piloted the, a the ATM loans so you can get a loan from an ATM without going into a branch. And then I constantly saw where can we just play around because we have limits. No, once a person gets to this point, we reject. I'm like, Let, can I just trial? Let's just play with some of these people that are bad risk. I'll, I'll, take, the cre I'll take the blame or the whatever because we have a mandate how much we're willing to lose. Please, can we try these people out? And then I will track their behavior over the months. And if I see over six months, 12 months, they're still doing bad, then I'll shut it down and we'll go back to where, to where we are, where we were. Um, we had a mandate. Uh, we had a mandate, but more than anything, part of what we needed to do is every project that we undertook had to at least make, I think, 25% profit. So there's at least that minimum before we even consider. If it's going to make 10% profit, leave it. Because we have shareholders. <laughs> now, who are the shareholders? And obviously, oh, white monopoly capital. Hey, Abelung. The majority of uh, banks, retail banks, if I had to thumb suck, probably have a 65% black employment demographic. That means 65% of their employees might even go all the way up to 80% are black people. Not just at the branches. I'm a consultant and the managers. I'm talking at head office. There are black people that work there who are making money. When you pay your high interest, it pays their nice salaries. Nice salaries. If you're working at bank head offices, you're meant to be paying well or earning well at least. They make money from you, those black people. Then you look at um, the shareholders. A lot of them are white, but then a lot of them are pension funds like the PIC. The Public Investment Corporation, I believe, has over 2 trillion rand that is collected largely from the government's employees' pension fund, the GEPF, and then from everyone else. The GEPF, for example, if your mom is a, is a teacher, if your mom is a nurse, if your dad is a cop, a traffic cop, if your, your mom or your dad or your cousin works at municipality, or those are public servants. Their money goes to the GEPF and it sits with the PIC. So when they speak about, you, we pension the army, it's at the PIC. And the PIC is the largest investor in the Johannesburg Stock Exchange. And they have huge chunks of shares in these banks. And it's not just them. Your old neutrals that sit with your insurance policies and other, your education trusts and whatever, your Sunlam. All these guys, they invest in some of these banks and in some of the big companies you guys call white monopoly capital. Now, if ever the banks lower their interest to to be a half NPO charity and give blacks money. That would mean less money would be made for your parents and their pension. They would lose their value. So if your mom was expecting a million rand because she's retiring, all of a sudden it's 800,000 because that money was actually invested in that bank or in that clicks that you guys were boycotting or in that shop right you guys were no longer buying from. It's a catch-22. What was meant to happen is we were meant to transform the economy. That means slowly move the, the, the white employees into being more black, the senior managers to become more black, the executive to be more black, the suppliers to become more black, and then the shareholders to be more black. So that over time, if we speak about a shop right, you'll find maybe Crystal Visa owns 15%, but the other 85%, 80, 90, 85% is, is black. And you're like, well, it's got a black CEO, it's got black executives, it's got black senior managers, black managers at the stores, black normal cashiers and security guards, the people who supply to the stores, the technology and the security and the cleaning are all black. The shareholders are black. That was what was meant to happen. But a lot of people don't understand money and the economy and we miss this whole thing. So when we fight and we're out there arguing, 
especially when it's driven by politicians because they need you to think in black and white because that's how you vote. You never have this real conversation and you miss out on it. And one day you will boycott the banks and then your mom will retire and have no money and your cousin will be retrenched because there's no more money and the banks will lose a lot of money because they were like, look, we were trying to fund people but they never paid us back because their businesses collapsed because they didn't know how to run business because they don't understand money. As a money coach over time, I became very frustrated because I realized people struggle to learn and they don't want to learn. Making money is boring. Boring. It's like maths. It's like double maths on a Friday afternoon when you're ready to go party. Making money is boring. That's why the richest people are losers. Losers. Don't look at entertainers. Don't look at sports stars. and They are small. The wealthiest guys are boring ass. Some of them are like, we're like the biggest nerds. Losers. But it's because they understand the game of money. They understand basic maths. They understand that if I sell this for 10 rand at a cost price of 5 rand, I'll make a 50% margin. And then I need to look at my net margin because I have other operational expenses. And you're constantly reading financial statements and you're constantly trying to raise cheaper funding. Whether it's debt funding or equity funding, you know, these are the terms that our grandmothers don't know. We're speaking Greek. How can I call me English? Here in Manjel, don't show you. No, mama, we need to leverage um, the assets that we have so that, you know, we can bolster our balance. Ooh. So there's a huge vacuum. But the point of me making this video is just to highlight that. There is no racial bias in the scorecards. However, there is a racial bias in the economy as a whole because black people come from a legacy of not having money. And even to this day, as 80% of the population, we don't have money. So it's obviously going to hold that we're going to take out a lot of credit products and behave in a funny way, which then discriminates on the score street, on the scorecard, which is not race based. But because you happen to be a financially illiterate black living somewhere and having funny financial behavior, it'll then come up and it will trigger. I think I'll stop this video here before getting a bit too deep. Hope you'll have a great Sunday. Um, I'm going to be meeting some of the people who enjoy my videos in East London at Hemingway's mall at 2 p.m. today. I'm looking really forward to that. If you would like me to come to your town or your city so we can connect and chat and educate each other, please hit me up via DM. I'm going to need a little bit of cash for the flight, for the transport, for the accommodation, for the food. But after that, I'm good to go. Love you guys very much. And I'm going to keep entertaining. <laughs> I'm going to keep entertaining and educating, edutaining you guys as much as possible to unlock your minds so that you can win in the real world out there. Penny Wallace, God, Penalism is the answer. Cheers.